This is not purely a nature documentary, although the wildlife is still very important to this story. It's about the men and women behind the scenes of frontline conservation who strive for nature's protection. Sometimes they can go like this and they draw using the mouth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can, you know, put the arm yeah. and draw from the far. These men and women are the park rangers working on the thin green line. G'day, I'm Sean Wilmore, a park ranger from Australia. I went to an International Rangers Congress and met rangers from all over the world. I was truly inspired by their stories of courage and conviction in their efforts to try and protect wildlife on this planet. So I sold the car and remortgaged the house and travelled the world for over a year to try and bring you their story. This is some of what I saw. He's gonna do a mold. He's gonna straight mount it with your head? Okay. is the most uh, dangerous that we have in Portugal. <laughs> She doesn't have any map, she doesn't have a map with her or water with her. Found me, I was sitting on a rock waiting for them. So. drives these men and women to become rangers. And that's where I met real life in the wild. So you, you say crocodiles, 
get to the elephants at the show and, and you know it was so fantastic and very exciting and you know from there I said great I think I love conservation yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's everything um, felt management fire management felt condition assessments those get done at the end of the growing season uh, monitoring its day-to-day -day stuff temperatures rainfall uh, anti-poaching patrols patrols to find uh, to areas where alien plants may occur, um, everything. Excellent, man. It, it's a very diverse job um, from law enforcement. It's basically area integrity management, protecting the integrity of the area. I felt I should offer a service to wildlife. I want to ensure that uh, the integrity of wildlife and the protected areas is protected. I just think it's awesome that so many people want to dedicate their lives to protecting the natural beauty and diversity and just other life, you know? It's an amazing job and good job. Actually, a lot of us are that way, and we we're doing it for the love of the, the job. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. yeah. I'm not getting rich off doing it. It makes me feel... I want to work the passing time I'm going to go to the work thing at the Like you, I will have a lot of footstep mupange, the lot of work at the I've seen my first baby uh, rhino calf born after we'd reintroduced rhino into La Palala wilderness. That was a, a great moment. Uh, uh, I can admit that I was crying when I saw that little baby. Excellent. Uh, in dealing with some, you know, some people you work with, it really becomes a real tight family group. Uh, a lot of the people I consider uh, as my family is, you know, some of my elders pass away. I kind of treat some of the, the people I work with here as my brothers and sisters. A lifetime chock a block full of, of probably the best memories uh, that anyone could have uh, for a working career. I've always said working as a park warden was like being a professional baseball player without the money. I think I, it's very good because I don't have walls. Yeah. And my office, it's very large. <laughs> and I contact a lot with the people and uh, I try to make the, the difference. There really is a committed ranger force in Ireland and, and really trying to trying to do the best for, for conservation in Ireland, for wildlife in Ireland. And yes, it's a kind of a thankless job and we're not we're not really getting through to the to the public or at least to the landowners. What we do is real life, it's not television or uh, CD ROMs or anything. And they are it's, it's quite spectacular which feelings they show sometimes when they are, you know, touching a real life or smelling a real life. Uh -huh. And Matt, does that make you feel kind of kind of special when you see when you see them react in a positive way and yeah, go away it's, with it's, changed it's, attitude? Yeah, in fact, that's what it makes all worth. Yeah, because you know you can you can change attitudes to, to things. Yeah, it's a quality of life, it's experiences, it's being out here. Um, it's a fantastic place for bringing up a family. And it's just something you do because you, you believe in what you do and it's it's great fun. We believe we can work together for this moment. Huh? Work together in the conservation. But we need help. At this moment, our budget is zero. Huh? My job in this moment is open the door to my house. I am welcome. This is the way. In the top of the Biarica volcano, in 2,847 meters. It's very good. Uh, this is my volcano. This is my, my park. Okay. Yeah, is there anything bad about the job? No, not really. It's That's getting good. away from the family. But you know, what mostly affected me, and especially my relationship with the families, when I reached home and my child called me uncle, that was more embarrassing. I said, Think about myself and my he family. He called you son. your own son, daughter? My own son. He called you uncle. Calling me uncle. 
So you can imagine how detached we are from our family. How did that make you feel? No, I, I didn't feel good, definitely. It was bad. You know, it's like, oh my God. That means my child doesn't recognize me as a dad. Just because I'm always away from them. But what do we do, man? We are going to do this work. I think rangers are born, they're not made. You can't, you can't um, teach a person to be dedicated. Um, ranger work, um, a lot of people think is very glamorous. In fact, it isn't glamorous. There's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of tough times, early morning, bad conditions. Um, you can't uh, simply not work because the conditions are, or don't suit you. So I think, um, before you even think about a qualification, the most important thing is for the person in themselves to be dedicated and want to be a ranger and understand the difficulties that you will experience in your career. In India, rangers have to balance the needs of a large population with wildlife protection. In the state of Goa, one such ranger is Paresh Parobe. I, I, I was always fascinated by uniform service and then I wanted to do something with wildlife conservation. And things clicked, there were the vacancies, I applied, it went in the right path and I got the job. I did my graduation in zoology and prior to that I was working with an organization called WWF. Uh, organizing camps for students and a lot of uh, awareness activities about nature and wildlife conservation. I did two, three projects. I worked on sea turtles, I worked on um, secret groves, and then worked on bats for four years. Did my research on species diversity of bats in Goa. So that brought me very close to the wildlife because my main interest was wildlife. So then I started studying plants a lot and everything around in the forest. It can be anything. And only, only service, only, only profession which can keep you closer to wildlife is ranger. With a population of 1.1 billion people and over 500 million earning less than a dollar a day, many rely on the forest directly for their own survival. Fresh needs to balance this with wildlife conservation. Here he takes us behind the tourist postcards and behind the scenes of the thin green line. Uh, after 5.30 the gates are closed. Yes. So we lock the gates, no, no vehicle can come inside yes. except uh, motorcycles because some way people they have bicycles and also we keep some space for them to go out. Uh -huh. But the four wheelers, uh, there's no play, chance to come inside. So when we uh, get any vehicle moving around the boundary in the late in the evenings and all, we try to uh, search. Paresh chases poor subsistence poachers through the forest, clearing it for firewood. It's a sort of machete, we call them bill hooks. They're deadly weapons. Can you go in to confiscate them? Yeah. Paresh takes out his gun because even though these are poor subsistence poachers, there are still others hiding in the bushes, waiting with machetes. They have come inside for firewood. So we'll just convince them and send them out. Uh -huh. yeah. Maybe they're ignorant, maybe they are trying to do something illegal. I'm telling them let to go. Yep. Uh, just told them what I, why I'm doing this action and what they should do. So they're asking this back. Yeah, I'm trying to fish out some information. 
about about uh, the activities, other activities, the illegal activities. And what are they saying? They are cooperating so far. Let's see. Paresh tried to find a solution for these poor people and for the environment. He attempted to get money to buy solar cookers. It's not, they are not doing it for commercial exploitation, it's there for home consumption. So, uh, they are dependent on firewood for the cooking. So we have to be a bit lenient. We cannot say no and things can go wrong. We warn them again, again, two, three, four times. I'm meeting them for the first time. This lady. I've not seen them before. So you give them a warning? Yeah. yeah. Warn them and then tell them the the implications if at all they are found inside again. So they have given me word that they will never enter inside again. Basically they don't understand. They feel it's a dead wood so they can easily take it. Yep. <laughs> so you're giving them their machine back? Yeah. They will cut it out. They have stand by their words. So they have convinced those people to get out. So they're not bringing the other people back to you? No. They have convinced them to go back. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So my purpose is solved. Mainly it, it it should be policing at the same time it should be the work should be action should has, has to give a message, a clear cut message that what is happening. Why, why we are saying no to it? So that's what I was telling them, whether you have been going to that forest earlier, now there is no more wood there, no more trees there, and the forest is gone. So now you come here, maybe after another year or no, so this forest will go. As well, when they were talking to me, they said, you are forest. They said, you are forest. So that's what I was stressing again and again. It's not and my it's forest. forest too, yeah. It's not my forest. I told them it's your forest. I'm just working here. I'm just a guardian of the forest. So Paresh told me it's not just subsistence poachers he has to deal with, but sometimes ruthless commercial poachers. There was this assault which has taken place long back, years, years back, when he was on a routine patrol. He was. One of, one of the colleagues was assaulted with matchet and the other, one, another colleague of mine. And so that's what, that was quite before when I joined into service. I was uh, buried alive in a, in, a, in a pit, sawing pit. But luckily he survived all that. Both of them survived. But there are so many incidents uh, uh, across the country. If you go down to Tamil Nadu and Kerala, there are more hair raising experiences with rangers. Um, you had to actually shoot a poacher because he, he tried to escape and he died. Um, was, that, was that a bad experience for you at all? No. It, it, was, it was not in this range. It was in, it was in, a, in, a, in a state called Tamil Nadu mm -hmm. where there's a lot of timber, uh, sandalwood smuggling. Yeah. But it's not a bad experience there because there it is required. Uh, there's a lot of organized poaching there. In Goa, it is not so. Uh, they are they armed. The poachers are armed too. In they're, they're, those states, yeah, they are armed. Yeah. My worst experience, I thought, is when I witnessed guys killing one of my friends. The rebels attacked us at the camp. From, from, from uh, Congo. Yeah, Congo. Yeah. That was in Semliki. And you know, the guy was just killed, cold blood, just because they wanted his gun. What I hate most is uh, like you get people killed and you really look at them and say, oh my God, people have sacrificed their life to conservation. We can find a lot of cases with arms. Almost all the operations that are done, all the fishermen are armed. Yes. Sometimes they are armed that are not from here, are prohibited in Costa Rica. Yes. They are armed from Nicaragua. Yes. They are armed from Costa Rica. Vince, I start to think to of worst experiences of other colleagues, rangers up in Central Africa, and that who fight wars daily and have rangers die next to them in combat, you know, protecting the areas and that. So you kind of feel almost like ours falling. They're insignificant compared to the battles they, they have. Yeah, I got a phone call uh, two, two nights ago from this, this guy down in South Connemara who said, uh, who after asking me a few questions, said if I walked in his land, I'd never walk again. 
And uh, I asked him, was he threatening me? And he said, yeah. So I, I hung up. I said, I didn't listen to threats. This was at your home? This is at my home, yeah. I have an office at the home, yeah. So uh, a few minutes later, he rang me back and told me I was unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was nice. <laughs> Yeah. I'm afraid he just knows where I live, that's the only problem. You know? And you've got children and... Yes, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. So you ever worry about that, that it might come back on your um, kids? Occasionally. Um, but I, I'm just hoping that it's hot here. Nothing has happened so far. And it happens to us here. I mean, I've had death threats, my staff have had death threats. Um, guys challenge you, we get shot at. Which is not a good feeling. Even your family are telling me you've had that. Um, yeah, you know, guys say that, you know, they know your wife, they know what your bushy drives and where she works and what's your kid's name and that type of thing. So they just, they try and intimidate you to try and back off. But uh, on the other hand, I think when they get to the stage where they that much worried about you, it shows that you're actually getting up their noses. So You're doing your job. On the one side, I feel, well, at least we're doing something. So I wasn't worried. Um, yeah. Didn't feel uncomfortable. He wouldn't have said that. And he put the gun in my seat in my head. So he had a gun? Yeah, I said a gun. You, have, you, you don't? No. no, no. And put and uh, you walk the up to him? in. You walk up and say, stop? Yes, I stop. I'm, I'm talking to him. Yeah. And he's very nervous. He put the gun in my, in my head. Like, to you yeah. like this? Yes, like this. All the time, he was going to shoot me. Yeah. But you, 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 you do the job again. I'm doing the job again. The protected areas are the areas that are prone for bad elements, more especially like rebel activities. Yeah. So being in the park, it means you have a risk. You run a risk of being attacked. Um, guys were out on patrol. It was a stormy night um, at Amatikulu, and um, they picked up. Um, signs made before that people were coming into the reserve illegally and the tournament had gone out and set ambush uh, for the guys. I was away on course in Maritzburg at the time and they saw people coming down with an animal carcass and stepped out to arrest them but there were other poachers um, in the bush that they didn't see and they opened fire. Uh, my guy was hit in the head and the chest with a shotgun and a 9mm and other ranger managed to return fire, killed one of the poachers and wounded another, but he then took a blast in the leg with a shotgun and managed to crawl back to the station and, and get aid. And we went out there. Yeah. So not nice, yeah. And then you found out about why you're in? Yeah, they called me in Maritzburg. I came back straight away the next day. and uh, We flew out that same day, flew out to, to the guy's family uh, to go and break the news. And how, was that? how does that affect you as a manager and a friend of this other ranger who as it tell his family. Yeah, yeah. It, it, as I say, it brings it back home to you that the job's not all, you know, sunsets and glory. It's, it's got the bad part about it. And, you know, having to go and see the family and break it. The only breadwinner, I mean, the mother, the wife, kids, you know, he's the sole breadwinner of that family. He's gone. And as it turned out, he took on a group of seven poachers and he managed to kill one of the poachers before he himself was killed. Um, it was a very sad day in my life. What um, was his name? His name was Fred and Tudy. Uh, yeah, and it was at Sudwana State Forest that he was killed. But, you know, there have been a few guys killed in the line of duty. Uh, but I mean, that, that was the only guy that I was really close to. Mm. And a guy that I felt a responsibility for because of the fact that he actually came back to me looking forward. Um, and I put him into the position that ultimately led to him dying. I think you've got to, I think you've got to um, accept that this is going to happen in our situations. And um, with the threats that we face, particularly in the Rhino Reserves, um, the, the chance is always there that somebody's going to take you on or somebody's going to wait for you or somebody that you prosecuted has got a grudge. He's going to come back looking for you. Um, it's part of your life. Uh, I think, uh, you know, again, in my early experience, uh, things were just as difficult from that standpoint. Now, we've had several rangers killed throughout the Park Service in the last um, 14 years. Mm. And again, in those days, it, until 1970, when the first ranger was uh, murdered, in my experience, at Point Reyes National Seashore, why it seemed like the scuffles that at least I was personally aware of even though I might not have been involved in them, seemed to be more uh, scuffles and, and physical confrontations and actual out and out, uh, you know, being murdered. So there may be an evolution there, more toward uh, truly lethal violence mm. than there was in those days. Mm. We have some quite difficult situations here with illegal marijuana growing, 
uh, in a remote part of these parks. We think that there's there's so much money involved in it. Uh, you cannot hardly rate a garden without hitting a million dollars in profits. So, wow. uh, you know, when you you have that kind of a, of an incentive, people want to keep that. Illegal marijuana gardens in national parks cause vegetation and habitat destruction, not to mention chemical pollution. They can sometimes be guarded by heavily armed cartels. Here, the rangers are charged with protecting both the park and its visitors. Sometimes the bad guys come looking for the park rangers. Here on the Galapagos Islands, the fishermen threaten to burn down the park office and beat up rangers if they continue to protect threatened sharks and sea cucumbers. Thankfully, the rangers get some assistance from the outside. Here on the Galapagos, Sea Shepherd provide boats and other much needed support. Paul Watson tells us more. Uh, there is a special law of the Galapagos, but it's not being enacted. For instance, you can't have an unloader vehicle here unless one is taken away. But there's an exception, then another exception. Now everybody's got an exception, so that's why the number of vehicles have uh, tripled. Uh, so the law means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for 200 bucks, you or I can become a resident of these mm. islands if we pay it to the right person. Mm. So it's uh, it's just total corruption. Everybody's on the take. You know, the military's on the take. And, mm. uh, so it's, you know, and I have to say, the only honest people that I've come across on these islands are the rangers. One such dedicated ranger on the Galapagos is Leonardo, who carries out marine anti-poaching patrols. Todo un proceso y llegas aquí y te das cuenta que el trabajo que hiciste de capturar embarcaciones o capturar pesca ilegal o capturar un arte pesca muchas veces eh, nos toca ver con desilusión de que la gente sale libre. While this fisherman was legal, some who are handed over to the Navy for prosecution are set free. As Darwin found, the Galapagos Islands are still home to some of the most unique wildlife found on this planet. On the Galapagos, rangers also breed endangered wildlife. Unfortunately for one, Lonesome George, he's the last of his species. And at 128, when he dies, that's sadly it. 
Oh, wow. That would be a good photo. Uh. <laughs> Not all rangers belong to big organisations. Some, such as Juan Carlos Gambarota from Uruguay, rely on their own resources to get the job done. But when you work alone, you have to do everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I collected spiders and I sent to Montevideo. I'm also collecting uh, beetles. Yeah. And the research about birds, mammal, uh, fish, and vertebrates in general is done by me. The Ombu forest here in the park is one of the only two Ombu forests known in the world, which two of them are in Uruguay. And here we can protect, we're protecting some uh, threatened birds of the pampas. Right. which need tall grass, uh -huh. okay? And the tall grass is uh, not very easy seen in the pampas because of overgrazing. Sometimes you also have to control the fence, you know? Uh-huh. If you are looking for heaven today, Which I do anyway sometimes. <laughs> what is a big problem I do? There. Uh, this is about the extinction of the species. Uh -huh. About the prairie or meadows. Uh -huh. Birds. Mammals. Native forest. Antarctica because I spent some time working in Antarctica. Uh -huh. And the wetlands and lagoons. They are um, for children, you know, they, with uh, paintings, uh -huh. I am the artist. You do the artwork too? Good. Yeah, well. I am very proud because um, I was the, when I was a child I wanted to, to know about animals and plants in Uruguay and all, the only available books were about foreign animals, Europe, mainly Europe. So I am very, very proud to say that my Excellent. books are the, the first books that children, Uruguayan children could buy. When you work in a small park like this, you can't do any, everything you want. So when you write books, you are in many homes. Mm -hmm. Children, they read your books, you are with them explaining things. Like Juan Carlos, many ranges around the world connect people to their environment, especially children, or the future of the thin green line. Little puffs of these spores are going to come out and of the top. And if it steps on it, it blows. And if it steps on it, it yeah. Yeah. And if you look really closely, you'll see there's tiny little insects yeah. crawling about on the surface. Yeah. And these, these guys will be laying insects. eggs, and you, the eggs will hatch out. Got... It's going to change colour. <laughs> and you can see this one. Yeah. The marshmallows change to kind of brown colour. They're quite cute, these guys, as you're saying. But when we're catching them, we have to be really careful. They do give you a nice bite. So if you see a koala in the wild, don't go and try and pet it. Yeah, definitely trying to get the message through to people um, of all ages, from kids coming through the park, getting appreciation, right through to neighbours, people living within the community. Do you, do you see that as a big role for rangers, the education component? Oh, it's a huge role. It's a really important role. Um, we actually have to... Um, market the areas we're trying to protect, get the message through and get support for the programs. And because sometimes you think it's so hard to change those minds because, well, the environment needs to be taken care of uh, so badly right now and there's so many things to say and so many things to do and sometimes you feel uh, 
a bit depressed of how little you in fact can do. You, you're only a small stick with a needle, you know. Yeah. And it's a very big rock you have to push. Many protected areas are islands in a sea of agriculture and housing, and animal populations have to be managed. Here in Denmark, they use this management to educate children. It's a very strong interpretation situation for, for children to, to experience because it, they have to face so many feelings in themselves because it's about, you know, animal that they normally think is very nice. They, you know, some of them they call this one for uh, Bambi. You call that, you know, the Disney one. Yeah. You know? And and they have to uh, to put this their Disney world nature look uh, into uh, the real world. And here they see a small Bambi who had been killed. So uh, the, the debate also starts with I'm a cruel killer that kills uh, ba uh, Bambis and so on. But and it's also about life and death. You know they. Most of those children have never ever seen a dead person or a dead animal before. So we have a debate also about the ethics about life and death and our right, you know, to to uh, to take a life. And in fact, we agreed on all of us that it maybe was the best thing to do to to hunt down some of the animals out here because if we didn't do, the population would explode in a, in a few years' time. You know, I guess it's uh, one of the hardest things is to manage people. One of the most rewarding things is to change attitudes. So if we can get, what make one affect the other, then that's a good thing. Here in northeast Arnhem Land, indigenous and non-indigenous rangers work together in the both ways approach to protect both cultural and environmental values. They install signs to educate people on rock formations that tell the story of visitors to these shores long before Europeans ever found it. For me, I think um, what Dimmu and, and the partnership they have with Parks and Wildlife, who I work for, is it's the spirit of cooperation. Like we're, we've got a spirit of conservation, but these guys have also got a very strong spirit of cooperation, working together. And it's a privilege to um, have Donalo as a buffo teaching me things all the time. He's always telling me the language names of things, even though I'm not very good at remembering them. I'm trying. Uh, he's taught me how to uh, hunt. He's taught me how to um, spearfish. He's shown me places, told me stories about places. Um, I couldn't think of a bigger privilege than, than having that experience. And I, I can never sort of repay it with the knowledge I have, I feel, because um, he's got a, a lot more to offer in that respect. Um, things that he's done for me as well include coming to my wedding and leading my bride to me, singing traditional Arnhem Land music and, you know, just memories like that you can't, you can't buy. They're, they're just um, something that I really treasure and I wouldn't have that if, if Bunnala wasn't as generous as he was to invite me to become part of his family and his clan. Just wondering about that Baru. It would be good um, if you were able to give us a hand this afternoon to get it out of the trap. Um... It's um, part of a management plan that we have in place around the town areas to try and um, keep the waterways a little bit safer for 
people that you know live in the towns and also uh, the young that go hunting in those areas sometimes request us to remove them. This is a small crocodile measuring two metres. They can get as large as five metres and bigger. The Baru, or crocodile, is a sacred totem to some Yulin clans, the Aboriginal tribe of northeast Arnhem Land. This crocodile will be taken to a nearby crocodile farm owned and operated by the Yulin. Crocodiles were hunted commercially here from 1945, and by 1971, the numbers had plummeted to only 3,000. They were then protected, and now over 70,000 crocodiles are found in the Northern Territory. Yeah, there it is. New Ranger Jarwaloo is called out to his first snake relocation, and this time, it's an agitated King Brown. Then were you were you nervous? Uh, no. No. Man of steel. Yep. And uh, what happened? Tell us what happened for you. It, it was striking, but I was, I stayed kept calm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and he had a couple of guys. And what did he do? He went under the under the washing machine or something? Yes. Went under the washing machine. Okay. And how did you handle it? What'd you do? How'd you get him in the bag? I just put the bag in there and just got the hook and just pulled him in. Straight in. Straight in. Very quick, man. That's it. Quicker than a snake. Another part of the job for rangers in coastal Arnhem land is to patrol for and remove dangerous ghost nets adrift from fishing boats in the region. These ghost nets trap and kill wildlife. To remove these nets, they must get there over land or by sea. It can be very heavy work. The largest net recorded was five tonne, four kilometres long, and 12 metres deep. I think probably the most satisfying experience I've had in this area is when we're working with the ghost nets and we come across turtles that are wrapped in nets and they're still alive and possibly, possibly been on the beach for a week or something like that. And we come along and cut them out of their nets and watch them swim free back into the water again. That, for me, that summed up conservation and um, what we're here for. And yeah, it gives you a good feeling in the heart when that sort of thing happens.
Like the ranges of Dimaru, ranges here in Norway also protect cultural heritage. And the purpose, the objective with the, with the protection of this area is, is uh, similar with nature uh, heritage and cultural heritage. So it wouldn't be right if we were only thinking about nature conservation. It's uh, quite as important to think about the cultural heritage because that's uh, one of the purpose of, uh, of the protection. They are professional bakers. This is an old building where they were baking the bread. Traditional Norwegian flat, but the word is the name of it. We have in November, we have a winter market here. Uh, every year, all year, uh, every year, winter market. Uh, when I was uh, a girl, uh, to work out in the forest, actually. Uh, I have seen films from, from Canada, from uh, USA, from other countries, uh, to work outside in the forest. But actually, I, I'm more a mountain person than a forest person. I, I couldn't live without mountains. Like most strangers, Rigmore has the dreaded paperwork to do. But it's not long before she's back out there again. What's very special, perhaps, for Norwegian National Park is that they are established also with the purpose to be a place for, for people to have um, the possibility to do uh, outdoor life, skiing, uh, trekking, climbing, glacier walking like this. Sometimes these activities lead to trouble for visitors and it's up to rangers to rescue them. Papa nine, Papa one. Like here in Canada, where a man has broken his ankle at the top of a mountain. Hey, I'll, uh, I got a hold of Alpine helicopters, Don McTie out of Golden. Uh, figured one way or the other we're going to need to get this person down from there. Good, I'm just approaching what's going on, so. Yeah, sling into the site. Assess the condition of the injured person up there. Talk to our pilot and let him know what our plan is. Uh, we generally do pretty basic first aid in, on the mountain and then try and get them down here where things are all cool before we do anything more. of the job where when you're dealing with a public safety incident where perhaps the lives and welfare of people are at stake that um, in retrospect well you'll always try and, and, and do the right thing the best th thing that uh, sometimes you're left wondering if you did or not you just dealt with another fatality and in my career that's the 63rd fatality in National Park the worst one was um, uh, I was called out um, and first on scene to uh, to one of our beaches where somebody had been swept off uh, a rocky headland during huge seas. I had to tell them that uh, 
there was no hope of finding their their son uh, alive. He just he, he just could not have survived that. It wouldn't have been fair to them to to have, have hoped that he may have. Seven of them were killed, and uh, we had to go up and deal with digging out the bodies and transporting them out of the out of the area. We having this being in fairly dangerous avalanche terrain as well. Um, but dealing with that number of, of dead kids, I found uh, really upset. También Rita estaba presente en cuatro erupciones. Y una de las erupciones más más fuertes y violentas fue la de 1971. Destruyó destruyó parte del, del, de los andarivenes que había en ese tiempo, el andarivén número 6, y transformó el, el, el parque en parte por, por el paisaje, debido a las, debido a las, a las fuertes aluviones que, que, que se desplazaron hacia el lago Yarriga y hacia el lago Calapquén. Cuando uh, I first, uh, the first few years I became a warden, uh, my best friend in town here, he, um, got killed in a climbing accident and uh, I basically watched him pass away. Uh, you just, you go through the, the stages of denial of having a, a friend that passed away and you kind of try to go on with your life and uh, you know things were a roller coaster for me and, and things changed but things always change for the better in the end so that's yeah. kind of how I end up coping with things. You know, this family uh, where they're having a picnic and they looked up and their and their small a year and a half old baby is gone. You know, you know what happened to it? You know, uh, you know, did a bear grab it? Did it wander off? Did, did somebody take it or what whatever was happening, those sort of things? And when you get there, you know, you know exactly what's happened. You know, this, like this child has been playing right against the edge of a very swift running river. And uh, and the, and the parents really weren't watching. And obviously this child got, uh, you know, sucked into the current and downstream. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. About uh, 45 minutes later, uh, two park wardens in the jet boat actually found this uh, child uh, floating down the river. But of course, uh, the child was dead at that time. Uh, very, very, very sad thing, very tough to deal with. Mm. Uh, and very, very emotional to deal with with, uh, with the parents. Like, it's a real tough thing to do. That'd it's be not, horrific, yeah. It's not easy. Uh, we had started a search and, and before we knew the suicide part of it um, we had people out looking around and doing a hasty search next morning we had a helicopter come in and I think we were maybe an hour and a half into the the search and we had at this point known about the, the suicide note uh, the range on the helicopter found him up on top of a place called uh, Great Hill which isn't too far from here a couple miles from here and, um, young man had shot himself in the head and uh, ended his life and it's, it's unfortunate you know it's, he's sitting here looking at a sunset at Acadia and, and said that's it and, uh, it's hard because you're dealing with family that don't expect that don't understand why um, they want their son back and done for the day but uh, got this call uh, at the Icefield Center regarding a, uh, a person that fell into a crevasse and uh, so had to uh, race up there and uh, I was first on scene and it turned out that it was a, a nine-year-old boy that had fallen into a crevasse uh, no wider than uh, two feet and he fell about uh, ten feet and uh, we spent at least four hours working that crevasse to, to get him out and uh, that's probably the, the single worst experience that, that I can think of. It's made me appreciate the fact that uh that life is random and unpredictable and, and there is no, it's not fair and there's no justice, but, but it is, you know, these wilderness areas and, 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 and the life, lives we lead here are incredibly and immensely beautiful and, and, uh, and while they are, take your opportunity to really celebrate it because um, there's another side too. And, and, uh, but, but as much as it can take it away, you can really be healed out here as well. So. For most rangers, there is that difficult side, but the job offers up some stories and experiences that most wouldn't call part of their normal working day. 
Um, uh, a couple close calls here and there. Yeah. You know, my, actually, my first fire I was burned over on. And you know, we think our main fire sucked up, or our back fire sucked up the main fire. And all of a sudden, we had spots across our line, kind of spread out. So we went searching for spot fires, and then um, there was just too many of them to handle. So we said, well, we've got to get out here now. And the row we were on got burned over on both sides. So we're taking embers, direct flame on our engines. Wow. And we decided, you know, we need to get out of here. Was there enough direct mm -hmm. flame on engines? Wow. And um, our engine decided we were going to get out because our stuff on top of the engine was starting to burn. Our mud flaps were melting off. Our headlamp, our head, you know, headlights were bulging out. We put shelters inside, and we, we went through direct flame for a couple hundred yards to get out. Jeez. And the rest of the guys sat inside the fire, and they felt safe and let it cool down. But that's probably the closest. Fire. We in patrol. This is a very um, public use. Yeah. National park. So the, Hundreds uh, and thousands and millions of people. So, so the big focus is on uh, people management. People management in summertime. Yeah. yeah. Winter time, poachers. Poachers. Uh, yeah. What do Wood. they poach for? Wood. Yeah. On the, Saturday, you go on. into the heart of the park, into another area, yeah. on a horse riding for Could three, days, three, three days. Three days. Three days. Yeah. Beautiful. Pretty close to the frontier, and yeah. nobody goes there. Oh, wow. So you're lucky. Ah. You're lucky. And is this a normal job of the park ranger, too? It's a normal job, and yeah. sometimes you don't have the chance to do it in high season because it's crowding. Yeah. But this is it's, it's getting slower. Yeah. So that's why the guys invite you to go. My horse just went half a metre to the right of the other horses and stopped a bit too long and got bogged. Well done, Javier. Well done. Come on. <laughs> Back on this horse, it was stuck in the mud. Got a gash in my leg. I've been thrown off a couple of times. Well, not really thrown off, but I jumped off. <laughs> but it's been a pretty good experience. And this horse goes wherever it wants to go, so... I'm, you're meant to be in charge, but I don't think I am. <laughs> Actually, I know I'm not. <laughs> OK, we are heading west. Yeah, our final destination. Yeah, our final destination. There are a couple of tiny lagoons that there are close to the border in between Argentina and Chile. Okay, we're here on the road entrance to the park office of Nando Antonio. We've been missing down rain for about three days or two days. It hasn't stopped. It goes from intensity to intensity. Anyway, that's the road right there. It's the park office. Here, high in the Rockies, we're searching out two male grizzlies in order to keep them away from people. I've been using quite regularly in the past. I'd like to check that out on the way out, and then we'll be heading back down to the main lake from there. We flip over the vegetation, see if there's still chlorophyll in the plants under there, to see how long it's how long ago it was flipped over by the bear. So there's still some green left in there. Also, how are you traveling? Are you making noise as you travel? Or are you traveling silently? 99.9% .9 of the bears, if they hear you before they come, they've already heard you and they've, they've left the country before you even get there and all you see is a few tracks or a little bit of sign. Sometimes the bears seek out people 
and it's up to the rangers to haze or scare them away to prevent an incident. Time and time again, the rangers need to educate. These campers had their car broken into by a bear because they brought their pet rabbit into the park. Well, we just received a uh, call of a bear jam, which is near one of our campgrounds called Wapiti. And uh, so we're just going to respond to that. We have a roadside bear. It's, uh, it's doing its thing, just feeding in a meadow. But yeah. uh, it's a really busy part of the park. Um, really bad blind turn. Everybody just kind of locks up their brakes and stops in the middle of the road when they see it. Uh -huh. um, so we're just trying to get traffic moving. All right. We're actually going to push the bear out of here because we don't have time to deal with the traffic. Gotcha. Hey, look at the baby. 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 People continue to feed this bear. Ultimately, it'll have to be destroyed. Rangers will attempt to save the bear by hazing it and keeping it scared of people to prevent further confrontations. But if people keep feeding her, ultimately, they will be responsible for destroying what they came to enjoy. You see a carcass of some kind floating there and bears swimming back and forth and all kinds of people out there in their canoes and kayaks, so we've got to go check it out and get the carcass out of there and separate these bears from people before uh, we have some type of an accident. And this is grizzly country. We have lots of grizzlies here. And, uh, you know, the park visitors would just... Uh, maintain that recommended distance of 100 metres from bears. And they could quite easily just watch... Enjoy, then they could, enjoy, they could the enjoy it, those sort of things, but we all know that people will do that. So, uh, you know, we've got to intervene, and especially in some of these parks where you get between one and two million visitors per year. And Unfortunately for the grizzly mother and cubs feeding on this carcass, rangers have to intervene because park visitors drawn to the scene continue to put themselves in danger. We've got a bear that's broken into the bank, into the, into the local bank downtown. And so I'm on the phone, and, oh, sure, sure, like, who's, who's in there playing a gag on me and stuff like that? No, no, Wes, it's honest, honest, honestly, like, uh, the alarms went off in the bank, and the police are down there, and there's this big bear in the bank, and so you've got to come down and do something about it. So I got the tranquilizer gun and actually tranquilized him, and he actually walked into the manager's office. He could have went to any other office. No, he didn't. In there he went, climbed up in the desk, and as he was passing out from the tranquilizer, they actually left a big deposit on the desk. Campground's quiet, and there's just one whippoorwill. You know, they sound like, like a whippoorwill. It's a, it's a bird. Uh -huh. It makes this loud sound. Uh -huh. It's repetitive, and it just goes on and on and on. And it's right above this guy's tent. This guy goes, shut the effing up. Just real loud. There's a campground, of course, in here, and they start responding to that. And I go, hey. He's like, what? Said, I'm a park ranger. He goes, OK. I said, hey. He says, what? <coughs> I said, uh, you need to be quiet the rest of the night, okay? He goes, okay, thanks. And he goes, hey, we're talking through this tent the whole time. <laughs> I go, what? He says, you see that woman over there by the campfire? And I looked over, and there's this woman in a folded you know, lawn chair around the campfire. She's completely passed out. And I said, yeah? And he says, we don't know who she is. <laughs> she, yeah. just, she just came up to our campsite, sat in a chair around a campfire, and passed out. <laughs> I was on my way to to Sotaro one day and there was a whole load of uh, cars piled up with elephant an elephant bull in the road with a sense of humor who was chasing the cars and that and I wound my way through the cars and I said no I'll just be patient let me chase him out the way and I got my way through and I revved him with the vehicle and chased him down the road and uh, he 
he turned tail and ran like hell down the road and we went around a corner and he was going full steam and as we came around the corner in front of us was a was another car and they were ambling along looking at birds with no idea that there was an elephant steaming down and, and luckily he veered off the road but their eyes were as wide as saucers. <laughs> Mate, there's some other animals with eyes wide as saucers just behind you there. Yeah, we've got <laughs> you seen the revision buffalo. mirror? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good ahead of Buffalo. Just come in the picture nicely. 15 metres behind me. <laughs> Here in Kruger National Park, South Africa, we came across a herd of elephants. They didn't quite want us to be there. And we were at a dead end road. So if we had just had a stop, she would have ran the back. Choice. Yeah. I tried to go from there, just to show, listen, I'm giving way. Yeah. And she decided no. I want to be clean. <sighs> so I say he moved off, and now he's feeling more comfortable, so he's going to show a little bit of... Show off a bit of a little bit of a Well, I haven't had a choice like that in a long time. Really? A long, long time, yeah, I must say. That was a good one. Oh, there they are. Rangers sometimes have the emotionally difficult task of controlling wildlife populations because of human pressure surrounding the protected areas. The experience that stands out in my mind is, is the first elephant that I had to shoot as part of the culling and control operation in the Kruger National Park. I firmly believe in sustainable utilisation and the need to, to manage game populations, animal populations, where uh, we're no longer in a natural situation, even though the large Kruger National Park is ring fenced was fortunate and with good training uh, was able to drop it with one shot, one headshot, brain shot. Um, and uh, it fell down immediately, legs buckled with a brain shot. I ran up and gave it a coup de grey on the back of the head and then I stood over it and cried. Uh, it, it's something that will always stay with me. I, I subsequently shot more, more elephants. I've, yeah. I've shot a lot of animals in, in the course of, of management programs. Um, but because uh, I have such an affinity and love for elephants, I think that's, that's one thing that, that's yeah. with me, yeah. What amazes and inspires me is that these rangers go out there day after day, against the odds, to try and protect wildlife. They're standing up for what they believe in. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. There we go. Another way? Yes, we are following this path. Ah. Just lead us to this truth nest. The other one is still yeah. on the right and the other one is lying on the ground. I think I need to demonstrate this one. I'll, I'll be the wild pig. <laughs> Alright, okay. Okay, I'm a wild pig. 
And this is what's going to happen to me if I come through this net. <laughs> and pulls tight. There's a wire. Oh, I'm stuck. I'm pulling. And there's a the wire. <laughs> Rangers can often be involved in the frontline prevention of illegal wildlife trade that continues to threaten the very survival of many plant and animal species around the globe. It's not always as obvious as ivory or rhino horn on sale. Illegal timber poaching, crop productions that clear important forests or developments can all be supported by you. Do you know the origin of all the things you buy? Yeah, I think I feel proud, most especially yeah. when I'm interested with all these two parks where we hold the critically endangered mountain bird. John sent me with rangers deep into Bawindi Impenetrable National Park on a search and destroy mission for poacher snares. National Park. The rangers went just down this way. I was just about to go this way, but what is here, just behind me here, believe it or not, a pile of leaves, but there's a snare. And we'll show you in a minute how that's connected, but I would have put my foot into that snare and I would have been waiting for the hunters to come back, <laughs> kicking and screaming for three or four days. So you can see how well hidden it is for the animals. Roll along the track and I'll show you how it goes up. It's a little I don't know if you can see it down here. Come on, come on. Oh no. 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 In this one, yeah. we have to make sure that we control the whole area yeah. clearly yeah. so that we can remove all the snares which are inside. All is very keen using the eyes, using the ears, and using the nostrils at the same time because he may have reached somewhere and he sets a cigarette. So that cigarette, the smoke of the cigarette, can also give us an indication that there is a stranger in the forest because. Animals, wild animals don't smoke. <laughs> Found it just already finished and rotten. So he couldn't even take it. We have to be quiet and then we listen. If we have to use the ears for listening, should we hear that there are some people who are talking, then we just take ambush and on the course of their movement, most of the people coming our direction, we get it. On this anti-poaching patrol, we removed 15 snares in three days. I got back and the rangers went back out for another seven. If rangers weren't on the thin green line protecting wildlife, I wonder how much would be left for you and I to appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. They have been adapted to, you know, developing bigger eyes. And so to get too much food, of course, you have to clear all this forest. And uh, so the pressure from cultivation and settlement finished all this forest. And of course, by the time the government realized they were supposed to protect the forest, all this had been cleared. And of course, when we go further away, deep into some place, we shall be able to see the extreme edge where it has stopped. And today we no longer allow any other activity 
apart from this exercise we're going to take this morning, which is gula tracking. Drinking and smoking and feeding with the gorillas is prohibited. So we can do the drinking here and everything else later. I think the gorillas are somehow, you know, this is about uh, maybe 30 meters off from here. This is about uh, maybe two, three minutes. And I think we are going to enjoy the beautiful view of the gorillas. Okay, so we go? Yes, yes. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> there is hope for wildlife and people here in Uganda, like many places I saw around the world, where communities and rangers came together to protect wildlife. Here, the money from gorilla trekking funds conservation, but also schools, hospitals and employment. This community has become part of the Thin Green Line, alongside rangers. You are the one for you I breathe So touch me now and trust always We are sadly losing species from our world every single day. If it wasn't for the combined efforts of communities and rangers, many more would already be lost. But maybe it's best summed up by one of the many inspirational men and women I met on the thin green line. You know, being a park ranger, you are really dealing with nature. No? It's, it's like you, you must maintain what God put on the planet. It's not like politics where you have got to lie. Here you're dealing with real, real things. Real things, not, not something. You know, and I love being with the nature. We are just one family struggling for one thing. We have to keep this working. They should keep the spirit of conservation and the spirit of wildlife in their minds, at their heart, and everywhere they go. Let's struggle, make sure that what is surviving on the world keeps on surviving until further notice. And forever and ever. Trust and smile, so sweet and safe. You are the one for you I breathe. So touch me now and trust always. to go.